Oh, hi. So I just came back from the Southern Hemisphere on March 22nd, and my biggest fear was that I was going to miss all of winter in Bozeman. <laughs> and now, on our 109th day of January, uh, I think the weather's finally broke. So I thought, if I'm going to tell you a little story about Antarctica, I should probably have some hat hair going on. How's that? Okay. Okay, I think I'm ready. Get this so I can move around. All right, roll it. I've always loved wild places. When I was a little girl, I used to run away to the, to the field down the street, and I'd climb a tree and think I was so far away. My little sister there, she used to come down the street to ask me if I was coming home for dinner. If mom was making spaghetti, I was coming. When, when I was that age, I didn't know much about Antarctica. In fact, it wasn't until I was 30 and I saw the IMAX film that I got obsessed with this place. I mean, would you ever expect a desert with only six inches of annual precipitation to have 70% of the fresh water on Earth? I couldn't imagine a place that could be so cold the sea would freeze around it to double its size every winter. A place with five months of continual sunlight and five months of darkness. These photos, or those photos, were in January, so it gets hot too, or sort of hot. <laughs> Last year, I was an aviation coordinator, multitasking like a mad woman for 60 to 70 hours a week. Worked with helicopters and fixed wing, and uh, it was nothing like a Zen experience. But the perk was that sometimes I got to fly, and that was really cool. Eight of us packed a bunch of shovels and went to a fuel cache site to dig out the fuel barrels so they'd be available to pilots who were going to field camps in as far away as the South Pole. So I'm listening to the hum of the engine, and I look down at McMurdo Station on Ross Island. It's surrounded by sea ice and the Ross Ice Shelf, and boy, it looked tiny. And all my stress just faded away into that cloudy sky. Then over the mainland, my gaze fixed on this frozen wilderness below. I used my little suede mitten to keep wiping away the frost that was forming on the cold window. And I imagined early explorers who covered this terrain on foot. Only 2% of Antarctica is not covered by snow and ice. In these dry valleys, it hasn't snowed in millions of years. This environment is so harsh and so much like Mars that NASA sends astronauts and equipment down there to test it in winds that can reach 200 miles per hour. There's photosynthetic bacteria there that lives inside of the rocks. And the glaciers stop dead in their tracks. I'd love to stand there and hear the tale that those rocks would tell me. So the pilots landed on this glacier. The landing was so rough that I'm like blessing myself because I think we're crashing. And then these smiling, confident Canadian pilots tell me, oh no, it's just another day. I'm wearing several layers of insulation under my down jacket and car hearts. I got these special plastic boots with air locks and fur over my, over my fleece and, and my ever crucial balaclava. I love that. So we can thank the wind. You see the fuel barrels there. Uh, we can thank the wind that we didn't have to do a darn thing. I'm just like, yeah, free time. My nose hairs are freezing up, my skin, my tears are even freezing. I take my 
hood and I squeeze it in front of my face so I can breathe into that warm air for a moment. And I ask a pilot if it's safe to go to those, those bare areas there because I want to see the rocks. The windblown snow is so hard and so dry that it squeaks. It's like you're walking on styrofoam. And every step, I move farther away into this silent place. And I stop. The silence there is so complete that I get this weird feeling. It's like a pressure on my eardrums because they're so straining to hear something, anything. My face is stinging, my, my hands are aching as I'm trying to take pictures with my camera. There's, there's not a smell in the world there. And some people call it a dead place. But to me, it's really special. It's peaceful. It's beautiful. It's isolation. And when I turn back to view this windswept area, I realize that what I'm looking at is, is what's underneath all those vast glaciers. There's rich colors and textures, and I start picking up rocks, some heavy, some light, some, some smooth and some rough or sandy. I imagine the early explorers hauling these rocks on, on their overladen sleds. I imagine their hardships, frostbite, exhaustion, starvation, as I slowly go back to my plane and my salvation. The others are beckoning me back. But I'm so much at peace here that I can imagine staying behind. Because I've come to the realization in Antarctica that it's the barrenness there. It's the landscapes that open my views rather than close me in. It's that stillness that makes life here all the more precious. I can live simply and mindfully, savoring greatness beyond my comprehension. It's here where these subtle colors are simple and delicious, and, and the sounds become a symphony. I slow down to experience fully what life presents, and truly, it's a gift. Namaste. Namaste.